you could be teaching martial arts or you could be teaching self-defense. But for most people, if you think those are the same things, you're delusional. Well, hello and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 252. Today, we welcome Rory Miller to the show. If you're new to the podcast or maybe just need a reminder, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. You can find everything we do at whistlekick.com. And I'm your fortunate host for this show, for all of the episodes that we do. And I have the best job in the world. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate your time and hope that you enjoy this episode. You may have noticed that we're doing some stuff bigger and better lately, whether it's the newsletter or more inventory or new products or better social media. And that's because we're growing. And everything we do is for you, the passionate, traditional martial artist. And that is all we will ever do. The things that you want as a traditional martial artist. No MMA stuff here. Never will be. We're all about TMA. <laughs> Rory Miller is a pretty straightforward martial artist. He didn't have any training as a kid because there was no martial arts school in his area. That made him turn to books and other resources about the martial arts. But today, Rory Miller shares his very deep and honest views of the world, as well as martial arts training and everything that made him who he is today. An accomplished author with several books to his name and an in-demand seminar instructor. Let's welcome him to the show. Rory Miller, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Good to be here, Jeremy. How's your weather? Weather is, for, for this time of year in Vermont, actually pretty good. The snow that came in yesterday is all but melted. It's, uh, I think it's knocking on 40 degrees. What's it doing out your way? We're having an epic rain and windstorm. It's gorgeous. Well, hopefully we don't lose you. If we do, we'll, we'll piece it together or something. The beauty of technology. We'll see what happens. I, yeah, well, I, I appreciate you being here. And longtime listeners are going to pick up on something that has never happened on this show. And that was the way I introduced you. And of course, you and I had a brief conversation oh. about that. But I want to talk about it because oh, yeah. it's the first time I've relented and introduced someone simply by their name. Why is that important to you? There are a bunch of reasons. Um, the... A, that's who I am. It's any, anything you throw onto that, you know, what, any, any titles um, is a way to separate people. And one of the things we've done very, very terribly throughout almost all the martial arts is that we're trying to make one of the most natural things in the world, which is not dying, which every animal does and most do with a pretty good amount of skill. And we try to mystify it and make it special. We put labels and names on something that we should be treating as one of the most natural things that you're here to get a little bit better at, but you're already born as a top end predator on the planet. This is just a polishing thing. And when we mystify stuff and when we, um, when we make it special, we actually start weeding out the people that most need it. They say, ah, oh, I couldn't do that. And those are the ones that need to be there. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Um, another reason is I have this, this like ethical base for teaching. And part of that is that I'm not better than anyone that has come to me in the class. They're all, you know, if someone does it, they literally keep the world as we know it running. Um, people could go for years and years and years without my training and never, never die. But a lot of people just go into complete meltdown if they lost their internet for a day. So the it wizards keep stuff going. A school teacher can keep a group of eight year old, 38 year old monkeys in line for a day. I can do that. And there's just this whole trying to keep any separation. And especially when you get into the really, really, um, I don't want to say traditional because it's not necessarily a traditional thing, but it's really freaking hard to teach someone to stand up while demanding that they bow. And those are just so completely incompatible. So I don't, I, I, we need to divorce ourselves, in my opinion, from that whole uh, I'm trying not to step on this too much. It's uh, when I talk about tradition, I'm not talking about tradition as a bad thing. Tradition is what we do when we don't have any direct experience. We go with what we've been taught. When most of the traditional systems are traditional because they survived long enough to get that title. 
but when they've been separated from their environment, when they haven't been used for a long time, then the forms of tradition become more important than the, than the meat, than the content. And that's, we're heavily there now. It's one of those, you know, 300 years ago, teach me taught, someone would be teaching their, their family, their clan members, the people that they were going to be going on the battlefield and living or dying with. And to that extent, you needed some element of military discipline, but you were always teaching people that you loved. And it's that dynamic is we've got to bring back into it. These are not um, supplicants. These are not any kind of children that need to be taught or bullied to become. They're the people that you're going to want on your back and you're going to teach them to cover you, to take care of you, to be on your side when you need it. And you don't want anyone inferior doing that. You want the best you can do. So that was a really long-winded way to say that I have never, ever in my life, in my head, been teaching students. I've always been teaching my backup. On some really, really dark day when I was working the sheriff's office, um, I knew I was going to have to call for help. And I wanted the best people in the world there to pull my oh, – I'm trying not to use bad words. But the best people in the world to pull me out of whatever I got myself into. and. That's I was never training my underlings. I was training people to be the best in the world because that's who I would need. So how was that for a really long-winded answer to a really simple question? Not that long, but yet really poignant and, and says a lot about you, your views on the martial arts, and I think does a good job of setting the tone for where we're going to go here. But what I love the most about what you just said, the the piece that stuck in my head, the notion of training your backup rather than creating that that stratification between teacher and student. I think that's what resonated for me the most. Have you cool, always resonate had, away. Have you always had that approach when you've is sharing it, I, I didn't, a better word, verb than, than teaching for you? I, I didn't want to teach. Um, I kind of got roped into it. Uh, we had a a very bad year. And in one year, uh, about a third of our officers were assaulted and 10% hospitalized in a single year. And Jose Martinez, who was a training sergeant at the time, uh, looked at statistics and we had to do something about this and pulled a couple of us, primarily uh, Paul McRedman and me, to redesign our defensive tactics program. And so it was... Yeah, so I started teaching, literally teaching my backup. And my job was to make them as good as fast as I could. And it turned out once we started changing our training methodology, it's not hard to get people pretty good pretty fast. So yeah, I've, I've always been, um, when, I, when I started teaching jiu-jitsu, classical jiu-jitsu, the only reason I did that was my sensei had retired. And I couldn't find playmates. I wanted to get people up to speed so they could play at the level that I played with my instructor students because it was fun, but it was, it was purely selfish. I wanted playmates. I didn't want students. I didn't want, I want people that could do in fighting randori the way we did. And that takes a little bit of skill to build up to. You're certainly not the first to start teaching or sharing or whatever verb you choose to use for that quote unquote, selfish reason. That was mm. how my original instructors got started. They wanted people to train with. Mm. So I, I get it. Yeah. It's, you get used to certain games and certain levels of play. And, and when you were lucky enough to have a really good instructor, um, it's hard to find people that can play the same games at that level safely. How did you get started? Where, where's the beginning for Rory and, in martial arts? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> thanks for clarifying. We were going to go into explaining birds and bees. Um, okay, I, li I lived in a place so small and so rural that there there was literally no martial arts, probably in a hundred miles. Um, so it was something that I heard about, um, read about. If you hit that late seventies vibe, it was one of those things. It was part of becoming a complete human being. Um, there, and it was one of those, I was, I was both really excited by the idea and at the same time, completely naive. I, I actually did not really grasp that there were different martial arts. Um, so I graduated from high school at 16, 
turned 17 that summer, went to college and signed up for the first martial art that I saw. So I was taking the judo classes and joined the judo club. And, uh, and that was just pure luck that I started in judo. And I am so incredibly happy that I did. The instructors were extraordinary. Wolfgang had been on the West German national team back when there was a West Germany. Um, Mike Moore had been one of the uh, uh, junior national champion here in the U.S. And they were superb instructors, really demanding. We had a running joke that you could take out the entire OSU judo team if you just caught us after practice. We literally could not put our shirts on by ourselves every day. Um, but and that was also they were old school enough. Uh, Wolfgang used to say, if if you were fight, if you weren't fighting two weight classes up you weren't doing judo. You were just doing mere wrestling. And I don't think I ever competed in my own weight class the whole time I was at OSU. So that's how I got started. And they set my bar for what qualified as a good instructor. When you look back and you think about the people that you've worked with, because you've, you've worked with a ton and you're making that distinction between a good instructor. So certainly you have ideas of what a bad instructor is. What are the qualities that make a good instructor? Um, wow. That's one of the, uh, okay. And this, this is the whole, bam, bam, bam. I should have thought of this question. This is a great question. Um, especially since I just did a book on how to teach. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Right. So, so I should be able to uh, just spit this out. But it's basically, or or among other things, you have to have an absolute thorough understanding of your system of what it is you're teaching. And that, as simple as that sounds, is there's so much to unpack. This is understanding, not knowledge. I don't care how much you've memorized everything in your system. If you don't understand the mechanics behind it and what it's used for and the goal and how it spins off into and affects everything else that could possibly happen, if you can't take it um, and look at it offensively, defensively, um, and I, I have this rule that almost everything that really works, you have to think of as you or you, me, and us. So when you're looking at balance, I, I have to maintain my balance. I have to disrupt your balance. But the minute we clutch on, there's an R balance that I have to be able to manipulate too. And so I have to see it at that depth. So understanding, absolutely critical for an instructor. Um, really high standards for both your students and yourself. And that's one of the things that human psychology, if I sit there and tell you that this is impossible, 80% of you will fail, 80% of you will fail. If I set the exact same goal and tell you this is, this is well within your capability, but it's going to be hard work, almost everyone will achieve it. Um, so understanding of this stuff, understanding the connections, um, teaching, knowing how to communicate it. And some of the best practitioners in the world are some of the worst teachers. And a lot of that is because they don't consciously know what they're doing. It takes an extra piece to consciously, so thorough understanding, both conscious and subconscious level, thorough understanding of teaching methodology, and that's got to stay conscious to continuously improve, because once you become an unconscious teacher, you'll be really good for some people and really terrible for others. Um, And one of the things I hit on a lot is clarity which is both clarity of understanding, but clarity of purpose and goal. You've got to know you, you can be teaching martial arts or you can be teaching self-defense. But for most people, if you think those are the same things, you're delusional. Um, you have to be teaching the student as the student is, not what you would do if you were in the student's place because you are not that person. So the actual clarity of the understanding of the problem, understanding of the, your tools that you have to solve the problem, and understanding of the student that needs those tools to solve the problem that student will get. Um, I think without those, um, you could be an okay instructor, maybe a good instructor, but you can't be an excellent instructor. That subject of making that distinction, you know, that a good martial artist versus a good instructor of martial arts and how within martial yeah. arts we do such a terrible job and I, I will i will be that blunt we do a terrible job of mm. teaching martial artists how to teach well and a lot of it is our what we know about teaching tends to come from terrible sources um it 
most people's exposure to teaching as a methodology comes from school. You know, everyone, almost everyone in the U.S. has had a minimum of 12 years of school, which is professional instruction from someone who went to college to learn how to teach. And we assume that that's a good model. And one of the things that people don't grasp, and this goes into the power dynamic in teaching we, we touched on earlier, in a school, kids don't have a choice. They're all there involuntarily. And when you have students that are basically prisoners, you can teach them any crap you want. And they can hate it as much as they want. And so we, we actually create a go along to get along is far more important than whether you actually learn anything dynamic there. And, and we translate that again, because when you're thinking, oh, how do I teach? Who's my best teacher? And you start recreating your, you know, your experiences from the third grade when you were small and weak and in a power dynamic and basically conscripted. And we try to treat students like that. And that's insane, especially when you're trying to teach students to stand up and be independent. This is all good. It's, it's giving us a good direction. And anybody that's read your books or knows who you are has a pretty good idea of your foundation. But one mm -hmm. of the questions that I'm most excited to ask all of our guests, and the one that I'm most excited to ask you today is about mm -hmm. stories. I know you've traveled. I know you've you've seen and done some crazy stuff. Well, I, I shouldn't say I know. I'm I'm guessing. If I was to ask you for your favorite story from this side of your life, this, this martial arts piece of who you are, what would that story be? Oh wow! Um, Got to go for the funny ones or the formative ones or one one of the ones that was big formative for me. Um, was at a judo tournament in Seattle and I'm fighting as a go Q lightweight in the knee Q and blow, uh, middleweight category. So I'm, I'm completely outranked, but good instructors. Uh, my girlfriend is watching the match and she knows nothing about judo and, uh, bigger brow belt flips me over and gets me in a, an arm bar, Juju Katami through the legs. And I'm hearing my coach yell at me to tap out before he breaks it. He'd just broken some other kid's arm with the same move. And, uh, and I'm hearing my whole team tell me to tap, to give up. And I see my girlfriend tell me to give up. And it's like, ah, see, not, see I'm, I'm looking at this sign that says family friendly. Don't use words. I'm thinking, no. No. And I uh, shoved into the thing which got my elbow off the point and was able to turn in. And the guy was so freaked that later he gave me his back. I was able to, to strangle him out. And, uh, but it was, it was that moment of having everyone that you counted on as your support network telling you to give up. And that, um, well, the relationship with the girlfriend absolutely didn't last. But that was, that was um, and it was all just common sense but I'm not big on common sense. I hate losing. So, but that, that moment I realized that a lot of the decisions I was going to make in my life later, I was going to have to make those decisions to, despite or against the advice of every single person that I knew. Um, so that, that was a big formative one early. I want to unpack that for a second. Um, okay. How much of the end of this this romantic relationship was because she was in this group of folks telling you to give up? Was was that I it? Did that have that much I, weight? I, I think um I don't know. I I mean I really can't pick apart. It was a it was a long time ago. I was much younger. I was a different person. I was taking like a lot of young guys, I was taking very small things and thinking they were very big and blowing them probably way out of proportion at, at this is a, you know, at, at the age I am now, if I was a coach and I had a young, arrogant, which I was a young, arrogant judo kid who I thought was too arrogant, who would get his arm broken rather than lose. I would have been yelling at him to tap too. Um, so it, it's no one, no one here is a bad guy or did anything wrong. Everything was doing everything when everything as right as they could. But, um, but for me, and, and relationship aside, it was at that time I realized that I'm 
and, and maybe this is true for everybody, but when you, when you decide to push your envelope, you're going to be alone and you have to get used to that loneliness and maybe revel in it. So is that enough to unpack? Cause I, I really don't have an answer for your specific question. And it's, I don't think the relationship was all that cool to begin with, you know, cause yeah, I have a girlfriend, but that was about it. Well, the the way you summed it up, you know, when when you decide to push yeah. the envelope, you're going to be alone. You know that absolutely that that makes sense to me. That helps me wrap my brain around it. But I'll I'll let you keep going. I think you had more that you were going to get into. No, it's a, oh, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it was another was, story. Uh, it sounded like you were you were setting you know, up a list for us. I used to be. I, I, I there's a list. I I, I want to say I used to be a way bigger jerk than I am now. And I, all this time I thought it was funny, but actually I was just mean and people interpreted it as funny. Um, I went to a, a seminar up in, in Seattle and this, oh, this has a, a sad part too. Um, uh, you know who uh, Johan Blooming is, John Blooming? I've heard the name. Okay. He was, he was Don Drager's roommate during that okay. whole period. He's yeah. the beast of Amsterdam. The reason why non-Japanese were not allowed to compete in, in the all Japan tournament. He's a super high ranked and super effective, uh, both Kyoshin Kai and karate and judo. Uh, and he was coming to Seattle and there's these old dragons, you know, you've got to see them when you can, cause they aren't going to live forever. And this was many years ago now, uh, I want to say 2002 or 2003. And I, I, I had just had something happen at work, which was pretty extreme. And knowing that, you know, I'd be waiting for a lawsuit for the next three years. And, and I'm with a bunch of martial artists who are fantasizing about doing some stuff I wish I had not done. And I'm, I'm in a really dark place. And, but I, I can't miss this seminar. And Blooming comes out and he's this old crippled up. And he, he just changes completely his footsteps on the mat. And he, he's an animal again. Um, but he's, he's talking about one of his favorite strikes, which is, which has become one of my favorite strikes now is, is hitting with the, um, on the little finger side of your palm, the small bone way down at the bottom. Uh, if you do it as a whip action, it has a huge amount of power and I've never hurt my hand with it yet. And he called it the show tie. Um, so he's demonstrating this and he goes, when you hit a man with your fist and you tear his ear off and you're sitting in a cold ass jail cell for four hours, wondering if he's going to die and what the police are going to charge you with. You wish you'd hit with something that just does the internal damage. And it's like, okay, I can totally learn from this guy. He gets my world. And it was, it was just an awesome seminar. At one point we were doing the judo and there's one guy, um, uh, I still remember his name. I'm not sure I want to put it on here. You can choose whether they have it out. But Steve Choi was one of the SF guys from um, uh, Madigan up there. And he came to this and he was, he was a blast. He rolled and he tapped me. He's like, fuck, nobody taps me. And so the next round, um, I'm rolling with him. And the first thing I do is maintain a, a Seogatami on him and kind of scoot over to the edge and open a water bottle and drink it while I'm holding him down. Just be the case. And then... Um, and then I tied his elbow to his belt without him knowing it and sprung away and he was tied up and he didn't know. So I was not a very good person, basically. But I think the stories are funny, but that's just me. When did you stop being a jerk? I don't think I have, okay. um, but I married someone really, really smart who points it out now. So I, I've got a little less less weasel room and I'm turning into a much better person with a lot of mentoring. Um, my wife has been trying to domesticate me for 30 years now and, and she's doing a pretty good job. Well, those yeah. are, those are great stories, you know, and, and there's some humor in there. It sounds, it sounds like you find the humor in, in a lot of things. I, I'm going to guess even in things that most people wouldn't. Am I, am I right? Yeah, you have to. It's one of the things one of the things I would tell my rookies is um, it's okay if you take yourself seriously and it's okay if you take your job seriously, but never both at the same time. If you do, you'll burn out. You have to be laughing at something. And um, 
laughing and crying are a lot the same, but if you start crying, there's always a chance you'll never stop. So you have to find the humor. It's, it's as far as I know, when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with bad things, I don't care whether you're, you know, emergency room surgeon, a medic, a soldier, uh, or what I was doing work in corrections. If you focus just on the, the poignancy or the pain or the, you know, incredibly, you see some incredibly messed up people and, you know, and, and they turn into predators, but they didn't have to. And you start finding out about childhoods and stuff. It's like, if you can't find something in there to laugh at, you will burn out. So yeah, I've trained myself very hard to laugh as much as possible. If you think back over the last however many years, and I ask you to pull out a time that was We'll just call it bad, you know, going through some, mm-hmm. some bad stuff in, in whatever capacity that yeah. was, you, you hinted at something. I don't know if it's going to be that or something else. Yeah. And you leaned on your martial arts, whether that's the physical or the internal side of it mm-hmm. to get through it. Tell us about that time and how you moved past. <clears throat> uh, the first time Oh. martial arts, the, the original judo was kind of a sanctuary. I didn't know anything about people. Um, you know, I've, I've been raised, you know, in a desert, basically on a survivalist compound, didn't know anything about people. Um, so having something physical, something mechanical, something I could understand was really good. Um, and it, it's one of those that wasn't a dark time so much as a time where I was completely ignorant, and naive, and it, it gave me a touchstone. It gave me a place where the world always made sense, and I could go from there and go out and try to figure out the rest of the world and come back there, and the world makes sense. So in that case, place and time, it was kind of like a harbor. Um, later, you know, first serious relationship that broke up, um, just threw myself into physical training just tried to exhaust myself every day. Um, and that was good. The worst one, and there's an essay in meditations on violence, the one about, you know, baggage. Um, I had a really bad year. And the weird thing is looking over my, cause I, I keep a little kind of notebook journal, not, not a lot of detail. Cause I was always afraid to be discoverable. Um, if there was a lawsuit over use of force, but it's one of those that year actually wasn't that intense, except it kind of was, um, I had my first body recovery of search and rescue. And it was a guy whose brains were splattered all over. He'd taken a foot or a hundred foot fall. Uh, a couple of friends committed suicide. Um, had, it, it, it's weird. I've blown a hole in someone with a firearm and the agency was never sure whether to consider a shooting because it was a less lethal round that malfunctioned. So it was rubber bullets that were supposed to hurt a lot and bounce off. And they blew a hole in them like a shotgun shell. Um, so that was, and that was just unexpected, I think is why that one hit me so hard. Um, and then the whole everyone treating you with kid gloves made it worse. <clears throat> and all your supervisors going, well, we want to advise you and talk to you about this, but we're afraid if you do, we'll be named in lawsuit too. So um, that, and and that was also the one where my intention was to, you know, it just training was what I did at the time. You know, I got to go deal, go go work out, get sweaty, pound people around. And that was the first time where I realized that most of the martial arts I was hanging out with did not get, did not understand what I did. And so that was it was actually the opposite. Of what you're saying is is going to martial arts to to this out. This is the first time martial arts failed me in being able to work something out. And it's the reason I started writing was to get it out of my head. If you had a similar situation come up now, how would you handle it differently? Ugh. What what would, yeah, God, God forbid, right? But right. what would your yeah. toolkit it, 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 for dealing with it be? If I get to the edge, one of it is, um, uh, writing and self-therapy is really, really effective. 
and I've gotten better at, at it. Um, and there, there's a bunch of stuff, you know, I've got a blog out there, but there's, you know, within the blogger dashboard, there's, there's probably 30 essays that I won't publish because they're about stuff like this as it comes up when it comes up in minor ways. So writing is one sometimes shared, sometimes not, uh, meditations is only published because Chris Wilder did that without telling me, um, the, uh, I have a better, I want to say a better support network. I know a lot of the same people that I knew then, but they're more mature, more able to deal with it. And I'm way more comfortable just talking about it. I don't have to sit there and pretend that nah, I'm okay. I, I can sit there and go, you know what? I'm really not okay right now. And I have people that I can sit down with and, and talk about that. So that if, if I was advising someone else, especially someone just going into a career field like this, maintain a good support network. Don't just lock into people that do the same thing you do under the assumption only they can understand it. Um, sometimes you need people that will accept without understanding. Um, you need people that will listen. And don't let people tell you you're supposed to be messed up. It's all a process. You're continuously growing and changing. Don't, and change doesn't become pathological until you decide that you're messing it up, in my opinion. So, those of you, and yeah, don't stop working out. One of the, um, wow, where do you want to go with this? How, how bad do you want this to be? I'm loving where this um, is going. I, this, this is a great direction. It's one that we have not had. <sighs> All right. One of my, uh, a long time ago, about in the era when the baggage thing was coming up, I was working a graveyard shift with one of my deputies and he was going through a lot of personal stuff. Um, and so we're sitting on a graveyard shift in a jail. Um, the euphemism is talking about mint flavored gun oil. And uh, the senior looked at me and he goes, you know, no one has ever committed suicide because of the stuff that happened to him. They commit suicide because they think about it too much. And we made a commitment from that time to keep moving, to just do stuff. And it's one of those, you know, I don't want to say no one because someone will come up with an example, but people don't kill themselves when they're working out, when they're training. Um, sometimes they, they go on long hikes to do it, but it's one of those, you keep moving. The, the thing is to keep living, not to wallow. It's a, we're physical animals and every so often you have to remember that and go be a physical animal for a while. And that's huge armor and huge healing to go into that. Well said. And succinctly there. said. How's that? It's great. What? It's great. Oh, well, it's, yeah. I think then how many little kids are going to get nightmares after listening to this now? Well, I would, I would hope that any small children that listen to the episodes have the parents, you know, kind of... Mm -hmm curating wow. a little bit because we do get into some heavy topics from time yeah. to time. And, and this is, you know, mar martial sure. arts leads to a lot of stuff. I mean, there, there is, there is at least, at least the premise of violence in what we do, if not the actual yeah. it's, application. It's racialized, but you were talking about violence. Yeah. If we take out that original judo experience, which clearly was quite formative for you. And I said, mm -hmm. who in the martial arts world you, you've got that outside, you've got that law enforcement yeah. influence. But if we corral it to the martial arts world, who's been the most influential? You're known as being a voice that speaks in a, in a slightly different way within our sphere. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious mm -hmm. who you take as inspiration. Uh, two people. Um, early informed is Dave Sumner. Dave was my jiu-jitsu sensei. He is pound for pound the best fighter I've ever run across. He's um, infectious, a truly good person all the way through. Um, but Dave was able to take an arrogant, really arrogant young judoka and, um, and form a really, really, and he did this with a lot of students. He made some really, really integrated fighters. Um, people that don't separate offense and defense, they're all the same thing. They don't, can lock, strike, throw, grapple and bite simultaneously. Um, he was really good at, at not letting things get separated in our heads. Um, and just 
uh, supremely skilled. And one one of his uh, a story about Dave, and I, I probably tell this a lot, so this won't be new to any of your listeners who've been following me. But when I first stumbled into jujitsu, I was looking for a judo school. We had just moved out to Portland. It's judo, as everyone, all right thinking people knew, was the ultimate martial art. I couldn't find a judo school, but I found a jujitsu school close to where we lived. And it's like, well, I guess until I can find something better, I'll spend some time with this primitive backwater judo variation, which is what I thought jujitsu was at the time. Um, and first week, Dave taught me three new entire principles to throwing. Three, not, not three new throws, but three entirely different categories of throws that didn't exist in the judo curriculum. Um, he wouldn't let me spar for the first couple of weeks. And I'd, I'd done karate and some other stuff, so I'm meh. And then he, he finally let me spar with him, and he was just a little bit better than I was. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll stay here for a little bit until I you know, have, have what he has, and I'll move on. And then one of his other black belts, who's this really old, crippled up, lantern jawed, you know, arthritic knuckles, goes, spar with me. And I go out there, and Paul tore me apart. He, he literally toyed with me. I had not been toyed with at that level in years. And I'm, I'm stepping off there, you know, trying to be all, you know, zen, but I'm fuming because, you know, why isn't he teaching this class? He's 10 times better than Dave. This is a, and, and then I watch him sparring with Dave and Dave was a half notch better than Paul was. And in the, in the, until I got near the very, very end of the training, um, Dave had that skill to take anyone from beginner to someone who was a, a national champion. And cause he, he did that, um, a couple times I witnessed and just be one half notch better than they were. And just, just give you that feeling. God, if I just work a little bit harder, I can take him. And you work a little bit harder, and he'd be just enough better to keep you on that hook, keep you working your ass off to get better. So Dave, uh, definitely hugely formative in me. And, and I would say that he was my transition um, from, from pure martial artist to actually doing it as a fighting system. Whether he knew or not, because I don't think Dave was, Dave was too... Like I say, one of the most effective fighters I've ever seen, but so absolutely nice that he could talk. On um, and the second, uh, Paul McRedmond Mack, the other big martial influence in my life. Um, I met him in my sheriff's office career, and he's the Vietnam vet with more black belts, and he has fingers who worked in jail for a while, and then worked enforcement for a while, and and doesn't retire very well. So he's retired like three times and keeps coming back in various capacities because he can't not fight. And he's getting old and crippled up. And, um, but Mac thinks differently. And he would throw some stuff out there that, you know, he, he would challenge me to do stuff. You know, well, you're going to be working in jail. Next time you get in a fight, try this. Um, and most of it was psychological on my part. Um, but, but Mac is the kind of guy who would go, see if just through sheer will, you can have no fights happen in the whole jail all night. And it's like, are you kidding me? He goes, try it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, he, he had me experiment with a lot of things that actually worked out pretty amazingly. And for the teaching side, he was working, working there, thinking about experimenting with principles-based teaching. He was experimenting at the same time with awareness-based uh, teaching. And when we got together and started comparing notes on that, it made for a really, really good system to get people good fast. It almost sounds like the two halves, you know, one being the physical, the strong physical influence, the other being the strong mental influence. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Were you... Yeah, Dave, six... Dave had one. Go ahead. Uh, Dave, Dave had one why, when I asked him, because I read a lot, so it's like... So I'd read someone saying that, you know, all martial arts have a spiritual element. And it's like, Dave, what's a spiritual element that goes with the system of jujitsu? And he'd go, hmm, well, dead people don't get to go home and pray. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Yeah. Were you successful at keeping the whole group from fighting for an entire evening by sheer will? Did that happen? I, I... We, 
had a night with no fights while I was doing that, I doubt seriously I had anything whatsoever to do with it. Um, but the idea that I could, um, I, I would work place and go in and try to manage, and, and you call it, Mac always called it managing energy, but it's managing your presence. And it's one of those, if I can go into a place that's normally pretty tense and be not obsequiously friendly, but, you know, engaged and alert and not like I'm looking for trouble. But if I did find trouble, I would be there to help you not get in trouble with your trouble. And that, and not just with the inmates, with the deputies, then it tended to have a pretty good outcome. You could, you could basically get one relaxed person and emotions are contagious and that relaxation would also be contagious. Um, and when you can, when you can have that presentation in a use of force, so you're, you're knocking somebody down and, and sweeping their legs out from under them and grabbing their, twist them into a, into a handcuffing position, but you're talking to them like, you know, you know, partner, we really don't have a choice at this point. The handcuffs have to go on. You know, as soon as you relax, let me put the handcuffs on. Everything stops, get you to a cell, get you some food. Everything will be all right, but you need to relax, partner. And when this is happening, when the physicality is intense, it does a definite cognitive dissonance on, on the, per, the subject. And a lot of them would surrender a lot faster. And weirdly, they would play it back in their heads. And one, one guy came back to me like 14 years later after one of these, after he got out of prison. And um, it was like, he, he actually said, I want to thank you because I was being a hard-headed kid and you were sitting there trying to talk me down. I couldn't see it at the time, but I wanted to thank you. So he'd been thinking about this for 14 years. I didn't even remember it. Um, so, yeah, there, there was a lot of the stuff that Mac advised me to do or to try worked really well. I don't think necessarily for the reasons. I'm not big on there's a spiritual universal unconscious that I can manipulate, um, but it still worked sometimes. Now, if you had the opportunity to train with someone new anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would you want to work out with? Um, there, let's see. I, I would love to play with Sonny Umpad for Sword. Because um, in, in fairly modern, um, there's something... As it's totally different than anything I've tried. Not in Sunny and Pud. Sunny and Pud, sword fighting, cool with that. Um, but sometimes I think about Wachi Karate because it's so not like anything I do. It's a lot of kata. Um, but, there's, but I see some stuff in their structure that I would really, really like to play with. Um, I would have loved to be at the early Kodakan and have, you know, so, some of the early guys see exactly what they had. Mm. Um, the let's see, I, I could keep going forever because there's all the historical. I want to see. I th I think the European sword schools were probably just as good or better than the Japanese. They just happened to hit at their pre literate phase, and I'd like to hit and play with that. Um, a good Italian Renaissance fencing master would be awesome. Have you gotten into the, the HEMA, the historical European stuff that's, that's growing I, I, right now? I, yeah, I played with some of them. Um, and one of the things I did in college was fencing and, um, and I did SCA for a while, which is fun. I liked it. A lot of the HEMA, um, they're really, really passionate. They're really, really good. Um, I, I played with a guy in Oakland who's, fun Jan and Jan's instructor whose name escapes me right now um Guy Windsor I like his books I met him he's fun Josh Amos out here <clears throat> so it, it's there and it's fun um but I, I would want to find a group to play with as opposed to ones that are trying to recreate manuals that they barely understand So I'm, I'm really big on play as a training method. 
far more than trying to recreate something. How do you use that word then, play? Different people use it in different ways. And for the listeners, if you could, if we could define play in this context, what would that be? Good question. Um, Sparring is obvious because we think about martial arts and sparring is a game. Um, And again, the harder and faster you do it, the more you have to have safety flaws. So one of the bad things about playing fast and hard is that um, you get better at not hurting people than you are hurting people. So that's the side. But play is the way animals naturally get good at stuff. They don't learn by rote. Cats don't learn to hunt by by sitting down and writing diagramming out. They they go out and they pounce each other and they have fun with it. Um so play engages the fun part of your brain. It's chaotic by its nature. You can't predict what it's what's supposed to happen. And that's the only way we get good at chaos is by playing. I think those are the two biggest elements. One of long term okay, two things. When if you look at a kid and how fast they get good at a video game, it's because they go through that first screen that tells them what the buttons do, the tutorial, and then they play. And they're competent in a couple of hours. People that try to get good at chaos by rote tend to spend years at it and never get nearly as good as someone who plays literally for hours. And that was Kano's epiphany about judo. Is if you, you know, this is too deadly to practice, if I take techniques that are less deadly that I can play hard with, they ingrain and they'll beat someone whose techniques are are technically superior, but they don't have the confidence in them. So that play element is huge. Um, It's the way animals naturally learn. Okay, I think I'm going to go with that. Okay. Did that help or not? Yeah, no, that helps a lot. And and in fact, I I really like the video game analogy because you've seen... You know, a, a kid, he's playing, and one of the parents tries to engage and sits down and picks up a controller. Well, how do you do it? And then they pick up the book, right? They fall back mm-hmm. on the book. How do, how do we do this? And they sit there, and they're reading the book. And after reading the book, it still doesn't make sense. There's yeah. still no context for it. You got to immerse and make mistakes. That's nice. That, that's a really nice... Because I thought of the book, I always think of coaching. You know, if we try to coach martial art or coach video games, so we coach martial arts, you know, how good is someone going to get with someone over their shoulder screaming they're using the wrong part of their thumb on the X button? Right. Yeah, but if we could, if I could fix martial arts in general, I'd do it like racquetball. So it's basically, you know, that sounds like fun. I'm going to play racquetball. So you play with your friends, you, you beat shit out of each other for a little bit, and then you go, oh, I want to get better at this. So you go take a lesson from somebody and then you go back and you're better. And then you're better at beating up your friends. And then you, uh, they start to catch up with you and you go take another lesson. I think that, that would be so much healthier and make this, again, rather than lineages and styles, people that are just good at doing something. If we have so. school owners and instructors listening, it sounds like you might be suggesting to them to spend a little bit more time in free form exercises rather than rigid Basics practice? If, if, well, if you want people to, um, if you want people to be good under pressure, yeah, absolutely. And the the pattern that I use is, you know, have a game, a general game. And for me, it's it's at low level skills, it's a one step, which is a slow motion but full contact, full intent. And at the higher level is in fighting randori, which is chest to chest, chest to back, or chest to flank touching. You stay at that range and. No holds barred, but you have to control contact. Um, so, so you have a general game, and then you you have I call them breakouts. So we come out, we work on one piece of that, like striking or power generation or leverage, or uh, have a class. And usually in that class, there's a specific game for it. Um, when I'm teaching leverage, for instance, uh, have you ever played cheese sour sticky hands? Yes. That's a risk contact. Okay, so we have a variation of that where you're playing Chi Sao and we take turns, but as you're doing it, my job is to let you get close enough to my face that I can put a hand behind your elbow and take your whole body structure and spin you and take you completely off balance or put you up on your toes or or lock into the elbow with my elbow and, and take you off balance. 
you know, so just an idea of where that leverage point is at the end of the humorous and that they can catch it almost all the time. And so they play with it. So you, you play this back and forth and then you go back. So general game, breakout skill building session, specific game, and then you throw them back in the general game. And suddenly these leverage points, which, you know, in the seminar format, you know, no one had ever thought of 20 minutes are now just part of their fighting style and they can't not see them anymore. And, and that's why play gets people so good so fast. So take them out, teach them, show them how sweeps work, throw them back in the game, take them out and show them uh, targeting, throw them back in the game. And that's gotten, that's when we're talking about the, the method that gets people competent fast. It's mostly about the play based they don't have to memorize techniques if they know the elements of what makes a technique work. You already know what hurts on a human body because you had a human body your whole life. And when you change it from this is the way you form to the fist, to, you know, don't hurt your hand when you hit something bony. It's like, ooh, then I'm not going to use a fist. Because everyone knows that. No one's going to hit a brick with a fist unless they've been trained to watch way too much television. So, you know, you don't have to teach the stuff that they already know. And you put them in a game where they feel really, really good when it works and they feel a little crappy and embarrassed when it doesn't work and they continuously get better. Where does the notion of competition fall into all this for you? You mentioned that you have competed. Uh, yeah. I, I, and I love, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hate competition. But it is good for me. And I don't hate the head-to-head competition. I hated the idea that someone that hadn't been on the mat for years would be in a position to judge the people that were on the mat. I I never liked the audience, and I never liked, you know, the refs have a safety thing, and they they can point out stuff. But the judges, um, that, that was the part that always bugged me about competition was the being judged part. Um. So it's one of those competition, play, resistance, absolutely important. But I have a personal thing about, I I want, I want the person telling me whether I'm good or not to be on the mat with me and feeling it, not looking from the side and deciding if I looked pretty enough when I did what I did. Um, So that's one piece of the competition thing. The other thing is if, if you do a non-competition style or you do a non-kata style or there's one part of your system or you do a kata style, not a non-kata, or if there's one part of your system that you don't like, I encourage you to do whatever that is until you don't mind. It's, the whole essence of self-defense is doing stuff that's pretty icky. And so if there's something within your system that you find icky on any level, part of your training is to do that. If you find caught up boring and pointless then practicing it it nerves you to doing things you don't like to do to doing chores which are a big part of being an adult and doing life and it can also lead you to the point where you can meditate to the point that you're doing stuff and using your brain for other things so you whatever you don't like i really encourage you to find the value in it and sometimes the value is just doing it even though you don't like it because i guarantee you if you ever have to put hands on a meth freak who's all scabby and covered with, with various oozing pustules, you're going to want to have some practice at doing things you don't like to do. That is both a very powerful reason for doing forms, kata, and a unique one. I have not heard that one before. Of course, it's quite the discussion in the martial arts world lately, but I love how you kind of it's brought the two sides together. Yeah. Same for competition. If you don't yeah. like competition, that in and of itself is reason to do it. If it's, if it scares you and mostly it's, it's fear of, again, audiences being judged or way more people would rather fight than sing in public. The fact that it scares you is reason enough to do it. Obviously you are an author. I'm sure. A lot of the people listening have mm-hmm. read your books or at least are familiar with your books. And we're going to talk about your books in in a few minutes here, but I want to talk about other people's books. What books do you cool. enjoy? What would you recommend to the audience other than books you've authored? Okay, I have an entire reading list on my uh, web page. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, let's let's link to that. But 
Okay. I'll, I'll send you a link cool. when I do the, the linking thing on the page you sent me. Um, but within that, there's, there's a whole bunch, there are a bunch of good people who have written some really good books. I like Lauren Christensen's stuff. Um, there's other stuff that I think you've got to, you've got to keep a very skeptical mind. And a lot of people have not practiced that skepticism. Uh, when you, one of, one of the unfortunate things about writing a book is you get automatic credibility. So even if you're just kind of, you know, doing a puff piece for yourself, people can't tell the difference. And that's, oh. all right. So you want specific recommendations? A couple would be great. And, and of course, folks, you know, if you're new to the show or maybe you've forgotten, if you're driving, don't, you know, risk death. We'll, we'll put all this up at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we do all the show notes. But go ahead. Yeah, if you give us okay. just a couple. Uh, I don't know how to do a couple. Um, uh, my favorite martial arts book of all time is Judo and Self-Defense by Bartlett. And it's a British book. And he set it up as a hundred lessons to black belt. But the cool thing was that every time I was having trouble with the technique, I would open that book and he would write and at the bottom of the technique, it would be points to watch in connection with this throw. And he would tell me exactly what was not working and why. So that, that was just very cool for me as a young judoka. I love that book. Um, one of the, and I'm, I'm trying to do some stuff that's a little bit off the side here. Yeah. So um, one of the interesting books that one of my students, one of the seminar students said, you have to read this and sent me a call. It's called Impro by Keith Johnstone. And it is a book about teaching improvisational acting. And it may be one of the best books I've seen on teaching fighting. Once you grab the, the similarities, because the things that mess up an impro improv scene are the same things that mess up a fight. It's trying to be clever trying to remember what you're supposed to do, anything that doesn't come from the nature of the character. And one of the big ones people don't get is stopping the action. Um, especially when you're smaller and weaker, um, you have more opportunity in movement than you ever will in, in immobility. So when some, something is coming at you hard, instead of trying to stop it, you try to use it and get out of the way creatively. And it's, um, and that was, it was just really interesting. I have this book from something that's, probably written from a guy that's, that if I said, oh, this is a good book on fighting, would probably um, mess himself. But really, really cool taking it from that side. So I, I again, encourage you to read, read the stuff within whatever it is you want to teach, but sometimes reach out to stuff completely outside and you will get some huge insights. Hmm. I'd never consider the similarities between improv and fighting i did some improv in college I didn't, you're it's, it's yeah. spot on i get it i i didn't either till i read this book it's like i haven't done any acting it's like i'm reading a book on acting why am i reading a book oh wait this is oh he nailed this um yeah it, it was it was uh, one some one of the things he had a whole section on status displays and it's like this should be part of self-defense training how how to you know how to sell exactly where you want to be in the hierarchy. So I dig it. Yeah. There's a lot of really cool stuff out there. Before we start talking about your books, a couple last kind of fun questions. I like asking these. Do you watch martial cool. arts movies? Um I I yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And the best of all time is The Last Dragon. You, you kind of hedged Bruce before Neal. you said yes, Bruce. and I'm, I'm curious why. Well, it's because it's, um, I've been doing a lot less of that lately. And at the same time, there's a lot of action adventure movies which have better martial arts than a lot of the old martial arts movies did. It's uh, my, my current addiction is a TV show called Banshee, which is like the Deadpool version of Justified. It is awesome. Completely over the top violence, uh, completely ridiculous plot line, and it works really, really well. So it's yeah. So I, I still watch movies, but a lot of the the whole martial arts as a specific genre has just blended into everything else. Very true, very true. Quite often on the show, we yeah. have people holding up 
movies that are not thought of as martial arts movies, you know, The Raid or John Wick as their favorite kind of current martial arts movies of choice. The Raid was pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. So, no, but the best is The Last Dragon. Bruce Leroy versus Shonuff, the Shogun of Harlem. Yeah. It's a classic movie, and if you've been a long-time listener, you know that we had Tymok on the show. Who That was, that was just that was so much he fun doing for me. And when you talk to him next time, tell him I'm mad that he didn't keep that acting going, because that was awesome. Oh, okay, I will, I will tell him. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure he, he wants to hear that from me. Um, yeah, because <laughs> I think it was last year. They reached out to us, because I think it was last year they were celebrating the, what was it, the 30-year anniversary or 25-year anniversary of that movie. So there was a big media tour, yeah. and it was all over the place. It was a lot of fun. Damn, I'm getting old. Oh, one, of, one of my favorite jokes uh, from completely non-martial arts related, I'll, I'll, I'll share this. If you're familiar with the comedian who's passed on, Mitch Hedberg, did all these no. brilliant, uh, often substance-influenced one-liners. Here's a picture of me when I was younger. Every picture is of you when you were younger. Mm-hmm. We can't help but get True. Older. Can't help it. Uh, there's one way to stop, but I'm not recommending it. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, I will accept that I'm wrong on that one. Let's talk about your mm-hmm. books. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You mentioned earlier that Meditations was originally published without your permission? Not without my permission. Okay. Uh, the, the original... I, I'd written it kind of as a, as a den show, as the the thing that I would eventually pass on to my students about all the things that you can't teach in class was kind of what I was doing with it. It was it was self therapy. It was just a big psychic vomit, and I sent it to a couple of friends that were you know experienced in martial arts just to get their feedback. And Chris, uh, and I don't know if you know Chris Wilder, but Chris is brilliant. And he can be obnoxious when he wants to. Um, but he, he's published several books for YMAA. And he called me. He goes, oh, hey, yeah, I got that, got that manuscript you sent me. Go, cool. He goes, I was on my phone to the publisher when, uh, when it came in, so I just sent it on to him. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that it just, just j- jolt of adrenaline when he said that. And, um, yeah, so it was, so it was one of those things and maybe I've been thinking about maybe this would be a good book to publish, but I think the part of me that's shy never would have done it. So, um, so Chris just completely went around that part of my personality. And then after that I was, I was a writer, so I kept it up. How many books do you have out? This is going to sound really stupid because I don't know. Um, I, I have, well, I did a, I have roughly, I, okay, I've got Meditations on Violence, Facing Violence, Force Decisions, Scaling Force, and Conflict Communications, and maybe another one from YMAA. But I also have some ebooks that I put out for myself, including like blog, blog compilations. Um, and, and those are the ones that I probably lose count of and one self published, which is uh, for writers, violence, a writer's guide. So a few more than one or two. You <laughs> yeah. certainly are a writer. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a note from the peanut gallery here. Oh, and they, uh, and talking them through is an ebook on talking down emotionally disturbed people. So it's a, my my wife is trying not to make noise while we're recording, so she's kind of trying to mouth this. It's like I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. So she just came over and wrote down talking them through because she likes that one. Why does she like that one? What is, uh, what's different about that versus the others? That. Um, that was based on a class I did for the sheriff's office on how to talk down people that were in extreme emotional distress or, you know, extreme mental illness. And there's not a lot on that subject that's been 
most of it is, let's see, I'm trying to say this without being mean. Most of it is clinical fantasy. Um, you get someone that's never talked to someone who wasn't at least stable enough to get to their office, trying to tell officers what to do when someone is, is literally, you know, stabbing themselves in the stomach to show that they're serious. And, um, it, it just one of those, it's more, yeah, there's just not a lot of information out of it. And secretly she probably likes it because that's one of the first covers she did for me. And the cover's pretty dramatic. Oh, nice. Okay. And we're going to have, of course, all these books, you know, mentioned over on the show notes. If someone's new yeah, you to your books, if someone's new to your books, where would you suggest they start? People are different. Um, if if you need the gut check, the psychological, you know, if, if you're either really, really sure or really, really in doubt, meditations on violence um, tends to hate people at an emotional level. Um, if you want something really, really useful facing violence, um, for almost anyone, the conflict communications that that was kind of a weird it was originally uh mark mcyoung and i were trying to put together a de-escalation program for police to talk criminals down but the beta test classes uh were more impressed the, the feedback was yeah this this would work on criminals this explains my boss and my wife and we'd stumbled on something way bigger than we had so if, if you get yourself in a lot of conflicts and you can't figure out why um, conflict communication is a pretty good model um, for instructors the, and, and for people who actually want to dig into their own psychology of it, the drills manual, um, which is what training for sudden violence. My working title was just drills, So that's what it is in my head. There's, it, there's a bunch of books out there. It's, um, it depends on what you're looking for, but there's something out there probably that'll help. And if people want to get a hold of you or find your website or I believe you offer seminars as well. If someone wants all that information, where will they find that? Uh, that's on my website, kirontraining.com and Kiron is C-H-I-R-O-N and then training.com. And it has, and I don't update it all that often, but it has a calendar for the rest of the year and I'm about to post a 2018 and maybe the 2019 calendar as well. So that's it. And it changes constantly. Uh, next gig is first weekend of December in Valkyrie martial arts up in BC, Vancouver, BC, and that'll be a full bio die. So I'll be team teaching with, uh, Randy King, uh, Tammy R. McCracken and Casey Kakaizen. And those tend to be very, very fun seminars. Oh, nice. Yes. Which I'm not allowed to name because I want to call it the VD clinic. <laughs> I wonder why. It sounds like you violence have... dynamic seminar. Yeah. Do, right? Uh, VD abso clinic. Right absolutely. There. Yeah. Well, you you may have some folks coming right? in off the street looking for something different. Uh, yeah, and that's that was why I told them I'm not allowed to name things anymore. But I liked it. I dig it. Yeah. What parting advice, last words, would you give to the folks listening? Um, okay. I got something for you. Um, <clears throat> never train out of fear. Never train because you're afraid of what bad guys will do to you. You've got to train because you love the training. Um, you're hanging out with cool people. You're learning how to throw big people downstairs. You're doing all that fun stuff. Makes you stronger, makes you faster, makes you better. Um, but if you're doing it because you're afraid of what bad guys will do, they're already controlling your life, even if they're imaginary. Never do anything in your life out of fear. It's fundamentally toxic. Do everything you want to do out of love. I found Rory Miller to be a very deep and insightful man. His passion for teaching paired with his humility, it's inspiring. But then again, so was almost everything else about him. Thank you for being on the show.
And thank you for listening to the show. If you want to check out the other episodes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all of our products and our other projects at whistlekick.com. Social media-wise, we're at Whistlekick, and you can find our show notes for this episode with Mr. Miller. See, I couldn't help but do it. His social media and the other stuff over on whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This was an episode that several of you were asking for. Quite a few of you actually had written in asking that we get Rory Miller for an interview, and we did. And I just want to offer that as a reminder that if there's someone that you want us to talk to, don't be afraid to reach out. You can get to me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and the website, comments, social media, wherever that goes, somebody will get it to me. Don't worry. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.